Thank you so much um, for joining our event today, Protecting the Human Right to Water in honor of World Water Day, which is an annual day of observance that highlights the importance of clean, accessible water for all. Um, tonight, we're gonna be hearing some from, from some really incredible water justice activists about the challenges we're facing with water access, safety and affordability, but also ways that we are working together to raise awareness and protect this resource. Um, so for those of you who might be new here, um, this event is part of Livable Future Live, which is our monthly virtual education series. And we meet here online once a month to cover a new topic. And we'll put the link in the chat where you can sign up um, for some of our upcoming events. Um, and before we wrap up at the end of the night, I'll share some more details on what's happening um, in April and May. Um, so first up, I have a couple of quick uh, Zoom reminders for everybody. First, um, the chat box is open, so please use it to introduce yourself, share where you're joining from tonight, um, as well as any thoughts or reactions as you're listening to tonight's conversation. Um, it's also where we'll share lots of links during the event, so keep an eye out there for all of those resources. If you need to turn on closed captioning to add subtitles to your screen, click on the live transcript button in your Zoom toolbar to enable that feature. And finally, I'll be recording tonight's event, um, so I'll be sharing that out later with everybody who's RSVP'd. Uh, many of you here tonight are members of Food and Water Watch, and so you know that we work to mobilize people and communities to build political power so that we can fight for the solutions we need to protect our food, our climate, and our water. So I want to thank all of our members and volunteers who are here tonight um, for all of your incredible support in our campaigns, including our work to stop water privatization, upgrade our water infrastructure, and overall ensure that everyone has access to water. It's your support that helps us invest in these long-term fights. So if you're moved to make a donation tonight, you can do so at any point through the link in, that we'll put in the chat or by texting the word gift to the number 23321. Um, all right, and now I have some really exciting news. Um, in just a few minutes, we'll introduce our panelists. And one of our panelists is Maud Barlow. And I know that many of you have followed Maud's impressive career of activism and read some of her other books like Blue Gold. And I wanted to let everybody know that earlier this month, Maud published her latest book called Still Hopeful, Lessons from a Lifetime of Activism. And in it, she reflects on her career as an activist and how she remains optimistic, despite the many challenges and the increasing atmosphere of pessimism that we can often find ourselves in these days. Um, I've heard Maud say, you know, hope isn't just for the good times. It's something that we need to always remember to have. Um, and I'm paraphrasing that there. And she says it much more eloquently than me in her book. Um, but five lucky viewers today will be able to get a copy of her book. We're going to be giving them away as a thank you for joining us in celebrating and taking action as part of World Water Day. So to enter the giveaway, all you need to do is click on the link that we'll put in the chat to enter your contact information and share one thing that makes you hopeful. So you can take a moment to do that now, but that form will be live for the rest of the event. Um, so now, before we go any further, I would like to turn to a special video message from Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence. Um, Congresswoman Lawrence represents Michigan's 14th district, and she is a leader in the fight for clean, affordable water for all. She's the lead sponsor of the Water Act, which would dedicate nearly $35 billion towards water infrastructure improvements across the U.S. And in honor of World Water Day, she has a message to share with us all. So let's go ahead um, and watch that now. Hello, I'm Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence, and I proudly represent Michigan's 14th Congressional District. I want to say to everyone, happy World Water Day. And to everyone at the Food and Water Watch, thank you for inviting me to help kick off today's webinar, Protecting the Human Right to Water. I always said that a pothole is an inconvenience, but water is a necessity to life. And I said that because as we debated investing in our infrastructure, we talk a lot about roads. And I am a firm believer that we should be investing in our priority investment should be in our water infrastructure. But if, unfortunately here in Michigan and Flint, then Harbor, Hamtramck and Detroit, 
We understand all too well the dangers of poor water infrastructure. That's why I helped to lead the charge on getting the bipartisan infrastructure law through Congress and on the president's desk. This is a once in a lifetime investment that we haven't seen since the New Deal. Billions into our roads, our bridges, and broadband and clean water. We're replacing lead pipes, and we in Michigan are so sensitive to that, delivering clean, affordable, and safe drinking water to communities across this country. The bipartisan infrastructure law was a huge, giant step toward ensuring water justice, but we can't and we must do more. My bill, the Water Act, further expands on this process by providing more funding to improve our water infrastructure and prioritizing disadvantaged communities with grants and additional support. I am so proud to work with you, the incredible advocates at the Food and Water Watch, and I'll keep up this fight in Congress. The World Water Day, let's celebrate the progress that we've made and recommit ourselves to ensuring every person in America has access to safe, clean, and affordable drinking water. Clean drinking water is not a privilege. It is a basic human right. Thank you. All right. Um, what Congresswoman Lawrence just shared is just such a powerful reminder of why we are fighting to protect our right to water. Like she said, a pothole is an inconvenience, but water is a necessity. And so that's why we need to be prioritizing our water infrastructure, which is exactly what her bill, the Water Act, would do. Um, and so from all of us here at Food and Water Watch, I want to thank Congresswoman Lawrence for her leadership on the Water Act. Um, I'm about to turn it over to our panelists, but I did see some messages in the chat that that form wasn't working. Um, it's been updated, so if you're still having trouble, just refresh it um, and you'll be able to submit um, your contact information there. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and introduce my colleague, Mary Grant, who is our Public Water for All campaign director and our moderator for tonight's discussion. So Mary, I'll turn things over to you to introduce our guests for this evening. Thank you, Kate, and thank you to everyone for joining us today to celebrate World Water Day. This is an international day to promote the importance of safe water. We know that every person has basic human rights to water and sanitation, but for too many people in the United States, access to safe water remains out of reach. At least 2 million people lack running water in their home. 15 million people experience a shutoff each year for unaffordable bills and as many as 45 million people have unsafe water at home. This is impacting rural and impoverished areas and black and brown communities hardest. And on top of it all, we're facing a climate emergency that is threatening the basic functioning of drinking water and wastewater systems for everyone, if we fail to act. Droughts and wildfires, floods and hurricanes, the threats to our water infrastructure and our communities are growing. And large water corporations are seeing ways to profit from these crises, harming all of us. From water bottlers like Blue Triton, it used to be called Nestle Waters, to water system privatization, to new markets that open up for large financial speculators to gamble with our water. The threats are many, but but so are the water activists, the advocates, the champions, who together are fighting to protect the future of our water. Tonight, we are joined by three of these incredible water justice advocates. I'll introduce them all and then we'll begin our discussion. First, I have the honor of introducing Maud Barlow, a lifelong water champion and chair of Food and Water Watch's board of directors. Among her various accomplishments, from 2008 to 2009, she served as senior advisor on water to the 63rd president of the United Nations General Assembly. And she was a leader in the campaign to have water recognized as a human right by the United Nations. She is the creator of the Blue Communities Project, which engages municipalities to pledge to protect water as a human right and a public trust and to ban plastic bottled water. 
And there are now more than 25 million people living in official blue communities, towns and cities, including Paris, Berlin, Brussels, Vancouver, Montreal, and Los Angeles in the United States. She is the author of numerous books on water protection. And as you heard, her newest book, Still Hopeful, was just released this month. Thank you for joining us, Maude. And we're also joined by Professor Marcella Gonzalez Rivas, who is the assistant professor at a graduate school of public and international affairs at the University of Pittsburgh. Her research centers on sustainable water policy, equity, and water governance, with a particular focus on Mexico and Latin America. She also focuses on how uneven access to water varies across communities and regions, and how planning can impact these inequalities. More recently, her research and teaching has focused on water access, protection in the United States during the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as on Pittsburgh's water challenges, aiming to achieve um, sustainable and water equity, sustainability and water equity. So thank you, Marcella, for joining us. And then to round out our panel, we are joined by an activist on the ground in the fight to protect public control of water. Catherine Miller lives in Chester County, Pennsylvania, and the, is the co-owner of a multimedia production studio. For the past two and a half years, she and her company have worked with the Chester Water Authority on Save Chester Water Authority effort to stop the privatization and hostile takeover of the water system. So welcome everyone for joining us. I'm going to kick us off with a question for you, Maude, to help set the stage and ground us in the history of these struggles. We are witnessing an alarming trend of Wall Street and large financial interests seeking new ways to control and exploit our water resources. The latest development of many is the new water futures market that allows financial speculators to gamble on water prices in drought-stricken California. Maude, can you help lay out the groundwork um, and discuss what you have observed over the last two decades about the ways that large corporate and financial interests seek to control water? and what that ultimately means for people. Well, thank you so much, Mary and Kate, and uh, happy World Water Day to you all. I come to you from Ottawa, Canada, um, the unceded uh, territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. And uh, it's a delight to be with uh, Marcella and Catherine as well, and to have heard Congressman, Congresswoman uh, Lawrence and her beautiful, strong statement to start this, to start us off. So I guess when I first understood that water was going to be a contested area in terms of who owns it, who controls it, was way back when I was re reading the very first of these modern free trade agreements, one between Canada and the US, way back when Ronald Reagan was present, president in the 1980s and realized that water was included as a tradable good. And I remember thinking, I don't understand how water is a tradable good. And that set me on a journey, and that journey led me to understand that in a planet running out of accessible clean water where the demand is going straight up and the supply is going straight down, of course, there are going to be very powerful private interests that want to control it, both for money and for power. And I think a lot of private interests knew before we did that um, they had a plan for water. And basically, it's a mighty contest that I call it. On one side are those who say water is a commodity like oil and gas to be put on the open market. Um, and Peter Brabeck, former CEO of, 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 uh, of Nestle, would say that it was, well, first of all, he thought the concept of the human right to water was ridiculous. But then he said, well, OK, but we put 0.5% of the world's water aside for the poor, and everything else goes on the open market on one side, of course. On the other side are those of us who believe that water is, and sanitation are fundamental human rights. They're a public trust. Um, water is a public service um, and, and we need to fight very hard to maintain democratic control over it because we're not going to protect either water or water justice if we don't maintain a democratic control. Very briefly, there is a kind of a continuum along which uh, the re water control is removed from people and communities. One, of course, is the privatization of municipalities, uh, our municipal uh, water systems, wastewater and drinking water systems. Um, and that's been a mighty contest. That started with uh, Margaret Thatcher in 1987 in Great Britain, and then the World Bank picked up the concept and said to global countries in the global south, if you want water funding, you have to go to a private system. And it's been a disaster where it's been tried. 
Um, the good news on that is that there are now something like 337 municipalities, including really big ones like Paris and Berlin that tried privatization and realized it was a mistake and, and backed away. Then you get into the area of what I call commodification. And that's basically where water and land are separated and the water is separately sold as a commodity. So now you're dealing with the actual water. This is a huge system in Australia. Australia has gone to water markets and water trading. It's been a disaster. The price of water went up hugely. It's been just a, 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 a pirate's land of grabbing water and people making huge amounts of money. Chile was privatized fully. The water was put on sale to foreign interests under the dictator uh, Pinochet. And of course, in the United States, Western countries had the first in time, first in right um, concept. And I think we need to revisit that because what might have worked 150 years ago to bring ranchers and industrial uh, industry out to, to the West Coast does not um, work anymore. Um, and so we now have the latest, and, and Mary spoke about this a minute ago, and that is that the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, not long ago, several months ago, without public consultation, went the next step to what we're calling the financialization of water and basically allowed the uh, speculation in water futures. And this is different than the commodification in the sense that you're not dealing with actual water, you're dealing with water assets, you're dealing with the, the, the water trust, if you will. And so big agribusiness, big equity companies, big investors all get to come in and uh, basically bet, bet on drought, basically bet on um, devastation and climate crisis. And of course, it started in California, where we have this terrible century, um, you know, first, worst in century uh, drought, continuing drought that's happening. And so if you can buy a whole bunch of water assets and hold on to them, you're going to make a great deal of money. And of course, they put they say that they're doing this in the name of conservation, which is stunning. But I just want to say congratulations to Food and Water Watch and many other organizations that have worked so hard because today on World Water Day, Senators Warren and Representative Rohana, uh, Rohana um, uh, introduced a uh, piece of legislation to uh, that would ban water futures trading. It's backed by about 20 other senators and representatives and 250 organizations across the United States and people across the world are thrilled that this is happening. I hear from people all over the, the place that they've understood it's gone this next level and what can we do? And I, I know we have limited time each of this first statement, but I want to say that in it, it, it for a long time I thought we were losing. If I had to say where the balance was, but I feel that our perspective has come out uh, for in the forefront, and particularly it's come out in the forefront during the the COVID pandemic. When we first were heard about COVID um, two years ago, we were told wash your hands with soap and warm water. And we very soon realized that half the world's population doesn't have a place to do that. So we're knowing now that the need for permanent sanitation, real solutions in real communities, in, in schools and, and clinics, imagine having a healthcare clinic during a pandemic and no running water. We're understanding that this is crucial. And we're also understanding that privatization drives the price of water up and cuts water off to people even in wealthier countries in the world. So this is really now an international issue. So I'm just delighted to be here um, on this World Water Day to share this with you and um, <clears throat> to, to keep hope going on this because I really do think that our global water justice movement, which got the United Nations to recognize the human right to water. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but the United States agreed to it at the Human Rights Council um, and, and has connected the world um, in a very important statement that water is not a charity to be looked after uh, by, you know, some aid agency, it's a human right. And that really is a profoundly different way to look at it. Thank you, Maud. That's a really good historical grounding and where we're at. And I am super excited about the new legislation from Senator Warren and um, Representative Kana too. I want to open it up now for Catherine and Marcella. Would either of you like to add anything or to respond to what Maud said? Go, um, go ahead, Marcella. Just real quick, I don't need to add anything to these excellent points and what an incredible introduction from Maud and from Congresswoman 
Lawrence, and also the amazing news about the legislation about uh, prohibiting the water futures market. I just want to emphasize that from a human rights perspective, any form of privatization, even the most complex and sophisticated new form, creates a disconnect between the private interest, which is based on a model of profit maximization and the goal of realize, the realization of the human right to water and sanitation. So I definitely think that any form of prioritization is in direct conflict with the human right to water framework. Thank you, I definitely agree. Catherine, do you have anything to add right now? I agree 100% with what they both <laughs> said. That this is an issue of the public good versus corporate greed. And that's something that we can't lose sight of. Well, thank you. And we are building toward our victories and challenging these corporate water barons. So Catherine, I wanna turn it to you now. You're on the ground fighting to save a water system from privatization. Can you tell us more about Aqua's attempted hostile privatization of Chester Water Authority in Eastern Pennsylvania? And then what's at stake here? Sure, I'm gonna share my screen because I have a couple of slides to share. Uh, so this is talking about one specific case of privatization like Maude talked about. So Chester Water Authority is a public nonprofit municipal authority that was incorporated in 1939. It actually dates back to 1866 and today provides clean, affordable, award-winning water to 37 municipalities in southeastern Pennsylvania, which equates to a population of about 200,000. And a key point is that Chester Water Authority has never been in operational or financial distress in its history. It has no need or desire to be privatized. So here's a map of the service area. Um, this is the Delaware River down here. Uh, Philadelphia is up this way. Uh, the namesake Chester City municipality is down here on the river. This is uh, Western Delaware County and Southern Chester County. The water source for all of these people is actually all the way over here on the border between Chester County and Lancaster County. In the 1950s, Chester Water Authority dammed up the Octuera Creek and formed the Octuera Reservoir. So that's one source of the, of the drinking water. The other is the Susquehanna River. This pipeline runs down and, and that's another water source for all the customers. Uh, this is an aerial view of the reservoir. Uh, this is a beloved public space here. It's open to the public. People come here to boat, fish, kayak. This is the boat launch over here. There's a picnic area. There's trails through these woods. All these trees were planted by Chester Water Authority after they flooded the reservoir. They planted 30,000 trees a year for a dozen years to build up this beautiful forest. So this is a, a beloved space here in Chester County and Lancaster County. And so what happened? Uh, how did this hostile takeover occur or attempted? We're stopping it. Uh, in 2017, Aqua America, which is one of the largest private uh, for-profit water companies in the country, came to the board of Chester Water Authority directly and made an unsolicited offer for $320 million to buy it. Uh, the Chester Water Authority board unanimously rejected that offer because it, it had no benefit to their ratepayers or customers. It's what they call their customers. And by rejecting this offer, they've actually saved their ratepayers over $200 million since 2017 than if they were Aqua customers. Aqua, not to be deterred, has since gone around trying to end run the board to try to convince the Commonwealth and the incorporating municipality to sell the Chester Water Authority out from under the board and its ratepayers. So why are the people against privatization, the community, the ratepayers and the community? Well, there's four main reasons. The first is higher rates. Uh, Aqua, Pennsylvania, now known as Essential Utilities, they changed their name in 2020. Uh, their base rate is over double what Chester Water Authority's rate is. Uh, Chester Water Authority uh, has estimated that a billion dollars would be extracted from the community every generation that would be taken in these extra water bills if it was privatized. And that has a ripple effect out into the local economy because it's not just the private residential water bills that'll go up, all the, it'll affect small business too. So your haircut and your pizza and your car wash will all cost more because their cost of water is going up. 
Uh, the second major consequence would be loss of access to the Atra Reservoir. And why we fear that is because Aqua has closed it, it access and developed its reservoirs before. Uh, this was is an Aqua Reservoir here. Chester, uh, this is in Delaware County, uh, the Springton Reservoir. They closed, it used to be a popular fishing spot. They closed it in 2001 and sold off the, the land around the lake to a developer who then put in a luxury senior living community. Here's a gentleman enjoying the unfettered views from his porch. Here is what uh, that reservoir looks like to everybody else in the public. Fenced off, fishing area closed, no trespassing. A third consequence would be loss of open space, that beautiful forest that you saw. Well, Chester Water Authority owns not just the 600 acre, 2 billion gallon reservoir, they also own 2000 acres of watershed surrounding that and protecting the reservoir, very developable land. Uh, also, this is kind of a philosophical reason, loss of control over our water. When you privatize, you're abdicating control of a vital natural resource to a private company. And that's actually a resource that's protected in the Pennsylvania Constitution, the right to pure water. In fact, the legislature went even further and said Pennsylvania's public natural resources are common property of all the people, including generations yet to come. As trustee of these resources, the Commonwealth shall conserve and maintain them for the benefit of all the people. Given that wording, I don't see how you privatize any public water source, to be honest. Uh, so what is Aqua doing since we're pushing back? Well, Aqua is a billion dollar company and they have a lot of money and this deal means a lot of money to them. So they've been sending mailers to our ratepayers. They've been running commercials on primetime TV spots. They ran a clickbait campaign on social media using some of our talking points and language to try to trick people to going to their website. Uh, but we've been fighting back. We created a series of videos about water affordability and what privatization would mean, for which the authority won four Telly Awards. I don't know if you can see that. Four Telly Awards last year for that work. Uh, we created a website, savecwa.org, which informs the public about what a sale would mean and ability to contact their representatives for help. We've handed out over 8,000 yard signs and hundreds of these um, uh, window clings for people's vehicles and their businesses. We've held petition signing events and staffed the polls on election day with our water droplet um, mascot here. It's one of our Chester Water employees in there. Uh, the SEIU union, who represents a lot of the Chester Water Authority workers, held a lobby day, and a lot of our supporters attended that and talked to lawmakers about anti privatization bills. Uh, we had a public water independence day last May celebrating four years of fighting the hostile takeover and we flew a, a plane over the crowd dragging a banner that says save your dollars save Chester water. Um, we've had to be creative. We don't have the money that Aqua has, so we, but we can be creative. We commissioned some political cartoons. This one, a senior on a fixed income looking at her bill after privatization. When your water rates double, it's too late and the meter is saying, screw you. <laughs> and here's the Public Utilities Commission, the PUC here in Pennsylvania, leading two poor unsuspecting ratepayers to a, 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 a grave that's just been dug in the graveyard of broken promises. And I believe we're the only municipal authority that's advertised in the metaverse. Here is our, uh, if you watch Sunday Night NASCAR, we have a car and on YouTube. You can watch uh, our CWA car. Our driver has won two races this season, at least. And when he gets interviewed after the races, he talks about, you know, hashtag stop big water and you don't want your public water system to be privatized. So that's a creative way to reach a new audience. So we don't have the money Aqua has, but we've been fighting and we've got the passion and the, the rate payers and the board and the public are all against the sale and been working very hard to stop it. And we're all coming up on five years of resisting. So we're, we're confident Confident we're going to be able to do it. Thank you, Catherine. I love seeing all those images and the cartoons. It's really wonderful to see the creative tactics that come out of different communities. I haven't seen the race car one yet. I'm not sure what that is, but it's really neat to see. <laughs> now that we've seen what it looks like on the ground, I, I want to turn it over to Marcella now to talk a little bit more about the research that underpins some of our concerns about water privatization. Marcella, we've worked together with Dr. Zhang and Warner from Cornell University on a new study that looks at the factors and influencing why privatization usually leads to higher water bills. Can you talk a little bit about what the study found? Definitely. And um, it, it, it was actually very uh, good timing for this study that just got published last Friday, just in time to celebrate World Water Day. 
And so what we did is that in our study, we analyzed the five largest community water systems to explore two questions. What are the factors associated with higher water prices in US cities? And what are the factors associated with less water affordability for low-income households? And so we analyzed several factors that are typically considered in these types of studies. For example, we looked at characteristics of water systems, like whether it's privately owned or public we also looked at whether the system is old or in other words, aging infrastructure, consider state regulation, the type of water source, uh, groundwater, surface water, or if the system is experiencing severe drought, as you can imagine, these factors tend to make water service provision more expensive. We also included in our analysis characteristics of the water demand in each place, like the size of the population serve, density, growth of the population and socioeconomic characteristics like poverty rates. And those are typical factors that go into these studies. And this is, these are important because it's important in highlighting the results that we consider everything. And our results are so clear, like this uh, graphic here shows. Basically, I'm going to discuss them like in three, like sort of like three parts. One, private water ownership. We've been discussing, right, the, the risks associated with private water ownership. So private water ownership leads to higher water bills and less water affordability for low-income households. In fact, private water ownership has the largest effect on water bills. According to our results, households served by private providers pay higher bills, an extra 144% on their average annual water bill. Also, in communities with privately owned water systems, low-income households spend 1.5% more of their income on water bills. So again, private ownership is a factor that leads to higher water bills and less water affordability for low-income households, as we've been discussing. But this is like a systematic analysis, 500 largest water systems in the US. Okay. Second set of results is that state regulation matters. That is, some states have created regulatory policy that is more favorable to private operators, putting interest of private owners ahead of public interest, which basically undermines the whole goal of having regulation in the first place, right? And so what we found looking at various industry documents, industry reports and other documents, we found that New Jersey and Pennsylvania have more regulations that are favorable to private providers. Some examples of these uh, mechanisms or ways in which this regulation is more favorable are in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, for example, legislations allow private, the, private, the private purchase of municipal systems without having a public referendum. So taking away the voice of the community like the Kat Catherine was describing, taking away that voice in whether you can have uh, um, sort of like the sale of your municipal water system. Another example of how this happens is that in Pennsylvania, for example, a new law, Act 11, allows a utility to spread the acquisition costs to all households paying for their water bills. Another law, Act 12, allows valuing water systems on market value instead of valuing according to its original cost, which basically means that the buyer pays a higher price, but it allows to increase rates in the future and that way recoup costs. For the seller, this represents an increased short-term revenue, like a gain, which can be appealing for a lot of financially distressed communities, right? But the burden is on the customers. The households are stuck with, with paying inflated prices of the water system. Okay, and the final set of results is that our study found factors like severe drought, aging infrastructure, and poverty are also very important uh, and are lead to higher uh, water bills, but also uh, less affordability in water. And so experts agree, we've been talking about these, that one of the key factors behind the rising affordability crisis in water is that until very recently, federal investment in water and sewer infrastructure had been decreasing since the 1970s. 
So as a result of that long trend, many water systems in the US are in large need of repair, maintenance, and upgrades. And this is why the recent legislation and the Water Act are so important, right? So um, this is going to get more complicated with climate change. Places that experience a severe drought, for example, make water service much more expensive and challenging. And finally, poverty is a main factor associated with less water affordability for low-income households. So for example, our data shows that many of the communities with the highest prices are in the industrialized places with old infrastructure and high poverty. And so what we are concluding in this study is that to provide adequate customer assistance and affordability programs in these contexts with high poverty rates, all water systems, right? We need comprehensive, uh, leg comprehensive sort of approaches. So the again, the legislation, the Water Act is really important because it requires state and federal support to really advance the human right to water. Thank you, Marcella. And it's really great to see how research is echoing what we're seeing on the ground and communities and the concerns that communities have. Um, and it's really helpful to have a study that just got published. Again, it's in the chat box if you haven't seen it, the full study, Water Pricing and Affordability in the US, Public versus Private Ownership. Um, so thank you again, Marcella. And now I wanna turn it to Catherine, just to turn it back to you to see if these findings resonate. Um, with what you're seeing in Pennsylvania, I saw that the Water Authority has also commissioned a rate analysis for the Chester area too. Can you tell us a little bit about the findings of that analysis and what they found that privatization's effect on water rates would be for the region? Yes, and I feel like we have the very similar results to what Marcella has shared. Let me share my screen. I'm gonna show you our map. Okay, can you see that? Um, this is a map of the Philadelphia area and the surrounding um, counties. This is Philadelphia, Bucks County, Montgomery County, Delaware County, Chester County. And Chester Water Authority commissioned a rate study um, to compare the primary water provider in all these municipalities, what is their actual annual water bill for a set usage? We chose 4,500 gallons a month. What would your water rate be? Because it's very hard to compare with these bills, some bill quarterly, some bill monthly, there's different fees that get added. So we had someone, a water rates expert, sit down and figure out what would the annual water rate be for these areas. So you can actually click on any municipality. It tells you who's the primary water supplier, uh, what the annual water rate would be. For example, this is Concord Township in Delaware County. They have CWA West. They have an annual water rate bill of just under $500. Um, up here, this is Aqua Territory. Here's Willistown Township. Their primary water provider is Aqua. And they pay upwards of $1,072. These rates are updated as of 2022 and the 2021 rate filing that Aqua just did with the PUC last um, August. And so if we zoom out, you can see less than $500. This is mostly CWA territory down here uh, is in the green. Yellow is $500 to $750 and red is over $750. And you can kind of do an exact analysis of what would happen if my water system got privatized. You could do a comparison because you can click on a municipal municipality. Here's Chester City, which is in CWA East. They pay just about $420 for their water. You can choose this drop-down menu up here. What if my, my provider was? And you could choose American Water, Aqua, or CWA. And so if they were Aqua, you can see their bill jumps up to $1,072, a 156% increase. So it's a very clear visualization of what would happen if your system was privatized. If American water is not quite as bad, but 116% increase. So still not great either. Um, and then there's an affordability component that we did by over, so there's an overlay. Right now we're looking at annual water bill. We can also look at median household income, percent needed to cover the water bill. So this gives a water affordability component. So back down here in Chester, city, um, if they have CWA, it takes 1.3% of their median household income to cover the water bill. If they had Aqua as their provider, it would be 3.3% of their income, which we consider in the red area of being unaffordable. So again, this is a clear way to see the effects of privatization in the area. And you can see that if you have CWA as your provider, how much more green there is than if you have Aqua for your provider or American Water. So. 
this is the the study that we've that we've commissioned and it's completely um, transparent and you can download the data we have the links of where we sourced all of the rates so this is an open source project and for places where we didn't have data we asked people to contribute and so we're trying to be as transparent as possible about this thank you Catherine that is a really fantastic tool for the area. There's a lot of privatization across the region, so it's great to see. Um, and it's a really clear visualization that does echo the findings of that national study. Um, so Marcella, I wanna turn it back to you. As you mentioned, privatization can exacerbate problems with water affordability, but through your work in Pittsburgh and your research internationally, what lessons have you found for how to better ensure water equity and access in every community? Yeah, thank you. So um, my research with various, various collaborators like Dr. Shoring and other graduate students at Pitt, we have found, so we've been doing work here, but also in other places, in other parts of the world, we have found to address like that, what, to address water equity or to advance equitable water access, interventions need to be very intentional. It's not is not sufficient that it's public providers. Still, public providers need to be very intentional. And so I'm just going to give you a few examples. So for example, in Pittsburgh, the main water authority, PWSA, has set up customer assistance program, uh, very like several customer assistance programs. But they have found that only a quarter of the expected households have registered. And this is pretty common, actually, in the literature of assistance programs. There's a lot of barriers to enrollment. And so to address this issue, the authority, PWSA, has been very intentional. So for example, they have set up a team of staff focused solely on calling households that show difficulty in paying bills to sign them up and make sure that they're enrolled to benefit for the, from these customer assistance programs. So the idea is to make sure that they're targeting the households that could benefit the most and that need this assistance. And this is, Similar, like this intentional sort of um, program design and, and, and intentional policy is what we have found other parts of the world, in other parts of the world has worked. So for example, in the global South, completely different context because universal access to water is a major challenge. For example, in Latin America, at least 25% of the population of the region do not have access to running water. But, of those countries that have made the greatest progress in reaching the most vulnerable populations, like for example, indigenous groups in rural areas, as in the case of Paraguay, who, uh, a country that set up a very um, sort of um, an amazing program to reach indigenous groups for um, in rural areas to reach uh, and advance water and sanitation programs. They were very intentional in making sure that they set it up as a public health priority in their development agenda. And so some of the things that they did was like making sure that aiming to reach the most vulnerable population was the key priority of the program. The design of the program incorporated technical capacity, technical capacity building for most of these vulnerable communities and making sure that there's adequate allocation of resources. And so again, intentionality is not enough to have assistance programs, it's important to make sure that the design is, is there like to remove barriers to enrollment and to make sure that you have adequate resources, et cetera. And the last thing is that what we found, for example, is that the importance of mobilization to generate the change needed in water access and water equity. So we did a case study here in Pittsburgh that shows that social movements, and it doesn't have to be movements, just like the engagement of different groups of people like Catherine and her group, for example, uh, is a key driving factor, but not only for preventing privatization of water, as is in the case of, that, uh, of, of Chester, for example, but also for other important outcomes, pushing for more transparent forms of governance, pushing for assistance programs and extending them, and pushing for lead line replacements. And it's not about uh, privatization, although that's super important. It's also about transparent governance and pushing for equity and, and, and water governance that works for everybody. So that's basically what we found. 
Thank you, Marcella. Water democracy will be crucial as we build our responses to the myriad of threats that we're facing for the human right to water, including corporate control as well as affordability challenges. And interlacing our water crises is our global climate emergency. Last month, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, released its latest scariest report that underscores how climate change is here and it's already harming people, particularly vulnerable communities. Climate change could overwhelm our ability to respond if we fail to act now. Maud, you've spoken before not only about the impact Impacts that climate change has on water, but also about how our management or mismanagement of water itself contributes to climate change. Would you like to elaborate on that now? Yeah, thank you, Mary. And just to say the incredible information that's coming out on this panel and the, the, the struggles on the ground and this brilliant material coming forward is just so needed. And it's just hopeful because I'm really on a theme of hopeful. Um, yes, we tend to hear a lot of climate people, a lot of uh, activists, a lot of environmentalists, a lot of scientists talk about it all as climate change. Um, back to greenhouse gas emissions and the, what we know is, is you know, the, the, the cause of, of the climate crisis as we understand it. And they wrap everything. So they'll talk about drought, but it's, a, a, you know, it's, it's, the, it, it's, it's come from climate change. It's a result of climate change. And of course, climate change created by greenhouse gas emissions does melt uh, ice uh, and, and, and glaciers and does warm up st uh, streams and rivers and lakes, which creates evaporation and does uh, make crops thirstier that need more water and all of that. But I, I argue, and I think it's really important for us to separate water from climate to a certain extent and say that if we were to end every greenhouse gas emission in the world tomorrow, we would still have a climate crisis. Many of the crises we have around water are our abuse of water, either removing water or vegetation from the local hydrologic cycle. You need water, you need vegetation, and you need sun. And if you remove either the water because you think, oh, doesn't, who cares about it being there? We want it here. We want to move it to where we want it, industrial use or industrial farming or free trade zones or whatever. We actually in, we interrupt the local hydrologic cycle and we create deserts. And we know now, for instance, uh, in, in the, the Dust Bowl of the 30s, all through North America, the horrific situation there, everybody knew then and after that they cut down the prairie grasses too soon and the, the, the topsoil blew away. But they thought that coincidentally there was a drought. And now we know, no, cutting down that grassland created the drought. So understanding that when we abuse, divert, over extract, pollute water, we are, we are increasing um, the climate crisis. And I, I would argue that our abuse of water is, is a cause of, uh, as much a cause of the climate crisis as, um, as greenhouse gas emissions. And the answer then uh, around biological restoration, biodiversity restoration, <clears throat> restoration of soil, of, of watersheds, of forests, of, of wetlands, um, is, is absolutely crucial if we're going to uh, uh, deal with this uh, conflict. I do want to say again in the notion of hope that I've been following the reactions to the notion that economic globalization and handing all the power over to corporations, which was so much a part of the, um, the mantra of, of economic uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the view that this every, every country had to take, every political leader had to take, that has been deeply challenged through the pandemic. And we know now that governments are important, governments are necessary, the whole notion of handing over to the private sector, the, the, the answers to the climate crisis, the water crisis, the humanitarian crisis is not working. And then when you get even the International Monetary Fund saying the, the private sector blew it, on the pandemic, there's no way um, we can we can turn back the clock to that model. I think we have an opening, and, and every pandemic and every crisis gives us an opportunity to rethink and do things better. But it also presents a time of deep contest, which I know we all understand we're dealing with. So, with the geopolitical crisis that's happening right now, with the war in Ukraine, the climate crisis, uh, and still the pandemic with us, is a moment for us to really deeply we think how we do things, what our values are. And I think it's a moment of great change and, and hope. 
Thank you, Maude. And given the great, uh, the grave state of our world, I feel inspired by your latest book. Um, you released, still hopeful, Lessons from a Lifetime of Activism. So to end um, this discussion, could you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write it and maybe one thing that gives you hope? Well, I was inspired because I worry about young people. I've got four teenage grandkids and I watch how they're taught around. It's the end of the planet. You know, we've only 10 years left of the acidification of the oceans and the climate crisis. And I watch them. They go from one who is so deeply ang anxious about it to one that's just ignoring it because this is, you know, this is the different way we deal with it. And I worried about them and this whole generation being potentially feeling hopeless and therefore the sense of hopelessness makes them feel that the situation is hopeless and the situation is not hopeless. And what we need to know is that the, the hope is a commitment to holding on and protecting everything that's good for future generations in the planet, knowing that while you can't control the outcome, you can, you can reach out and, and touch the web of the universe where you live, where you can do something. And the two wonderful other speakers tonight are living this, living the, the, the solution and taking action and making a commitment, making a long time commitment is absolutely um, crucial. Uh, so I want to say particularly to young people, but to all activists, take a deep breath, um, enter into what uh, Joan Halifax, a uh, wonderful spiritual leader, calls wise hope, which means, yes, you have to look the situation in the eye and you have to be realistic and you have to grieve, but don't despair, take action. And when you're feeling overwhelmed uh, by the enormity of the task, just ask yourself, what's the appropriate next step to take? And you take it. And I'm filled with hope. I think we are making, I don't think we've ever been more ready to deal with the climate crisis than we are now as a, as a human family. We know so much, there is so much information. At COP26, the leaders were saying the same things people on the streets were saying. That doesn't mean they're doing what they need to do, but it means that we're coming to a consensus and an understanding. Uh, and things are, ch are shaken up. The old order is really shaken up and I, I look forward to what's going to come out of it and it can only happen if we have a vision of, of hope and intergenerational working together. Or as uh, Banksy the cartoonist, the political cartoonist in London says, if you're tired, learn to uh, rest, not to quit. Catherine, Marcella, would you like to share one thing that gives you hope? We can start with uh, you, Marcella. <laughs> sure. I mean, as has been said, and as Mark just said, it's interesting, like that idea of the wise hope, right? It's not that we are being uh, in denial of the challenges that we face. And also observing that the risks and the threats and the emergencies are not the same for everybody. So some people are having a harder time than others. And some of us are more privileged than others. And so still recognizing that's the state of the world and the inequalities of that climate change and many other, and all the other crises, we have to name them, you know, COVID, like all of the crises that are um, coming together, but still, so recognizing it's a very difficult a moment for a lot of people and people de face different things and, and different levels of challenges. But I like, or it energizes me to see the level of commitment by so many activists, by so many people getting involved. And even if they're not doing, like they're not professionals, they're not full-time doing it. Just the fact that people show up for webinars, uh, the incredible work that organizations like Food and Water Watch do, but also many others at, in different parts of the world that are like really fighting and putting up big fights, right? That is what energizes me. And Catherine? Something that gives me hope is that this is a completely nonpartisan issue. Um, I started working on this, you know, in 2019, coming up in the 2020 election, we had people at the polls. And if you drove around my town, you saw Trump sign, save Chester Water Authority sign. 
Biden sign, save Chester Water Authority sign. So it was completely, that was so nice to work on a common ground issue. And this is something I, people, volunteers at the polls, I said, don't talk about national politics. You guys will not get along. But on this issue, we all agree. We want to keep our water public. So it was, it's so nice to work on a common ground kind of bonding uh, issue like this. And that gives me hope that we can actually make progress and succeed here in, in Pennsylvania. Mary, I just think of uh, a lovely, uh, concept that uh, Rebecca Solnit shares in her book, Hope in the Dark. She says, progress isn't an army marching forward. It's a crab scuttling sideways. You know, it's, it's decades or centuries of water dripping on a stone, changing the stone. We don't know where success is going to come from and, and we can't preordain it. We don't get what we want, when we want, as we want it. We shouldn't go home and feel sorry for ourselves. We should just take a deep breath do some self-care and get back into the into the struggle because it is about social change it is about cultural change it is about changing attitudes uh, and and that take that's hard work and you don't know where success is going to come from but you have to have faith that others are doing something too and you don't you can't possibly know what or how it's going to to, to change but change it will and change i've watched it in the women's movement I've watched it on the climate change and I'm, I'm watching it here um, with our views on water. The, the notion that water is a human right is deeply entrenched now and that's because of the struggle of our, of our global justice movement. What an amazing note to end on. So thank you <laughs> for everyone. And I'll share one thing that gives me hope too. And it's some, the three of you being here tonight, um, the work that you're doing, as well as building that movement like Maude mentioned, because it is going to take a movement. It's not one person, not a leader. It's the people on the ground. It's um, people in the streets, people calling their neighbors, getting involved and, and taking action and realizing that their role in government can go beyond voting. It can go to participating and making our democracy work for everyone, our water democracy work for everyone. So that gives me hope. And so thank you so much to Maude, Catherine, and Marcel. It was such a pleasure speaking with you this evening. I have a couple of things I want to share with everyone before we wrap up. First, earlier today, Food and Water Watch published new research about how the Water Act will help protect the environment and public health. This year, 2022, marks the 50-year anniversary of the passage of the Clean Water Act. This is a pivotal environmental law that helped clean up our waterways. But as our report outlines, and as you've heard tonight, so much more work needs to be done to improve our water infrastructure. Marcella mentioned this trend earlier, but since its peak in, 19, in the 1970s, federal funding for water infrastructure has dropped 77% in real terms. On a per person basis, that's a decrease of federal support of 84%. The bipartisan infrastructure law, um, again, bipartisan, like Catherine mentioned, it was passed last year and it provided $55 billion for water over the next five years. And that's a step in the right direction, but we cannot, we cannot let it be the end of the federal commitment to our water. It is only 7% of the $744 billion that the EPA has identified that our water and wastewater systems actually need over the next two decades just to comply with existing water quality regulations. So as we celebrate the Clean Water Act, the 50 year anniversary of the Clean Water Act, let us commit to doing more for clean water and to strengthening our clean water systems. It's time for the landmark water legislation for the 21st century, the Water Affordability, Transparency, Equity, and Reliability Act. We'll put the link in the chat for you to learn more about how the Water Act would restore the federal government commitment to safe and clean water for all. You can also take action right now tonight to support the Water Act by sending a message directly to your members of Congress, telling them to become a co-sponsor. Earlier tonight, we heard from Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence, the lead sponsor of this legislation in the House, about how big an impact the Water Act would have on improving our water infrastructure. So be sure to take just a couple minutes to send a message to your representative and your senators. The Water Act is the only permanent solution to funding our nation's water woes, providing $35 billion each and every year to restore our public water infrastructure. And with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Kate who has a few final updates and on the giveaway of Maud's new book, Still Hopeful, as well as upcoming events. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I hope you had a wonderful World Water Day.
Thank you, Mary. And I want to also share a huge thank you um, to Maude, Marcella, and Catherine for being here with us tonight. That was such a powerful conversation, and I'm just so inspired uh, by all of the work and all of the activism um, that you're doing. So thank you so much. Um, and as Mary mentioned, um, if you haven't already, please don't forget to click on the link that will drop in the chat for you to enter your name into the giveaway for a copy of Maude's book, Still Hopeful. Um, we'll be selecting those five winners later tonight, and I'll be in contact with you tomorrow um, to confirm um, your shipping details. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, today's event is part of our uh, monthly virtual education series called Livable Future Live. And we have some exciting events coming up in the series over the next couple months, and you can see our lineup here. Um, so you joined us today for World Water Day. You can join us again next month on April 22nd for Earth Day. We'll be hosting an Earth Day virtual summit, and we'll be talking about the top three ways we can work together to protect our food, water, and climate. And we'll be going live to the field to hear from our organizers and volunteers around the country about how they're celebrating Earth Day and the volunteer activities um, they're doing. Um, so I invite you to come learn and celebrate with us. Um, and at that event, we'll also be giving you a sneak preview of a new documentary film called Dear President Biden, directed and produced by John Bowermaster. Um, and we'll hear from John himself about the film and we'll share some more information um, about where you can catch a screening once the film is released. Um, and then in May, you can join us again. We'll be talking about the economic costs of food monopolies and digging into some food and water watch research about how the consolidation of factory farms and grocery store chains is impacting us as individual consumers and impacting the prices we pay. Um, so you can sign up for um, either of these events at the link in the chat. Um, and finally, before I let you all go, um, I encourage everybody to share your feedback with us after the event is over. Um, in a little bit, you'll receive an automated email and text message where you can submit um, a rating and send in any thoughts about the event. So we hope that you'll fill that out um, and everybody who does will be entered into a drawing um, to win a Food and Water Watch bandana as a thank you for participating in the survey. Um, so again, you'll get that link um, in an automated email or text that will come a little later this evening. Um, so that brings us um, to the end of our event today, but I want to thank everybody so much um, for being here with us um, and celebrating World Water Day. Um, so thank you all so much. I hope we'll see you again on Earth Day. Um, have a great evening, everyone.